We're pleased that you've tuned into this sermon. It's part of a larger worship experience here at the church. And our prayer is that as you listen, God has a word for you. So in our sermon series on the Beatitudes this fall, we're being invited to think a little differently about what it means to be blessed. Because if we normally think about what it means to be blessed, or if we were to go and ask a friend or even a stranger on the street, what does it mean to be blessed? The answer we would most likely get is that to be blessed is to be wealthy and prosperous and healthy and have good family relationships and a bright future. You know, when we experience those kinds of things in life, it's easy to let fly, uh, I am so blessed. That's normally how we employ that term. But in the Beatitudes, Jesus is, well, he's not denying that we're blessed when we experience those things, but he is inviting us to expand our conception set of what it means to be blessed by actually including some places and some situations we come to in life that are anything but blessed when we define it that way as the good things in life. And Jesus does this in the Beatitudes in order to prepare people to hear the main body of his teaching as Matthew presents it in what is popularly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. In the Beatitudes, he's inviting us to understand that When we do come to those hard places in life, when we're grieving, when we're sad, when we're depressed, when the world isn't working as it should, when we realize that we ourselves are falling short of our our best intentions, when we kind of come to the end of ourselves, it's precisely at that point, and this is what Jesus is driving at in the Beatitudes, it's precisely at that point we're perhaps most ready to receive what it is he has to offer. Because Jesus, in his earthly ministry, was absolutely focused on the kingdom of God, or the reign of God, bringing heaven to earth in a new way. That's what he thought he was doing. And he lifted up the kingdom of God, not, or heaven itself, not as some, you know, reality far away that you know, we can be inspired by, but it really doesn't impact us. No, for Jesus, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, life as it should be, life ordered God's way was possible here and now. And the price of admission was simply repentance, which is a fancy way of saying turning from sin and self and turning towards God in a new way. He said, come to me. The price of entrance is just, it's forgiveness, and I'll offer that to you. And then, in his teaching ministry, he was trying, you see, to educate people as to how life works in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and encourage them to give it a try, you know, give it a spin. I think that's the best way to understand what's happening in the Sermon on the Mount. I ran across a a woodcut uh, recently, 19th century, by the artist uh, Julius von Schnorr uh, Karelsfeldt which I think illustrates Matthew's setting of the Sermon on the Mount so nicely. And what we see when we look at it, there it is, an image, is, uh, you know, you have Jesus front and center, right? And he's clearly, you know, teaching. You know, the use of hands when you preach is really important. (laughs) As you know from watching me flail about here, week to week. And he's seated. Matthew wants us to understand that Jesus is at a, he's at a high point of ground, and he is seated. And uh, some scholars historically have said, well, that's because the seated position was the normal preferred posture for any rabbi who was teaching or preaching in the world of Jesus' day. But uh, uh, Jewish historians and theologians say, no, that's not true. You know, they could stand, they could sit, they could do whatever. Uh, most likely Matthew has Jesus seated in order to give the Sermon on the Mount because it's a very long sermon. And the idea is Jesus would have wanted been sitting for that. (laughs) That's why you'll let me sit, but only if I break my leg or something. The minute I'm better, you always want a preacher who's standing, not seated, because that's going to be a long sermon. And the Sermon on the Mount's long. Now around Jesus, you've got some individuals, and what do they have over their heads? Halo. So we look at that and say, well, artistically, you know, uh, 
Von Karelsfeld is, is trying to indicate that they're holy and they're pure, but they're not because those are the disciples. And we know because we've read the Gospels, the disciples were anything but perfect. So why do they have halos? Well, what that signifies is that we all want a, a, a reconciled relationship with God, but we, we don't know how to go about that, and we certainly can't earn it. So again, the price of entrance into the kingdom of God for Jesus was just repentance and to be forgiven. And it's not that we make ourselves righteous or right with God. It's, that's a gift that Jesus offers to us, one that is completed through his death and his resurrection. So this is really important, and, and the, the artist here gets it absolutely right. Jesus is teaching the disciples in the Sermon on the Mount. They're the ones that he's talking to. He is seated, and he is teaching the disciples. He's welcomed them through the gift of, of forgiveness, through their act of faith, into the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And now, in the Sermon on the Mount, he's going to tell them how the kingdom of God works and invite them to maybe just maybe enter into it. And all those people standing around, you know, the crowd that was there that day, as Matthew presents it, they're just kind of listening in. He's not teaching them. They're probably not ready for what it is he's trying to communicate. And then there's two characters in the foreground that I think were really intended to take notice of. Bottom right, there's a man. And is he paying attention to what Jesus is saying? Well, yeah, I mean, he's really thinking about it. But as he's hearing how Jesus is describing the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and he's receiving this invitation to enter in if he wants, he's got his hand resting on something. What is that? It's a sword. And that sword symbolizes uh, how the world works. Violence, oppression, power, authority, getting your way, imposing it on others, all those ways you and I know the world normally works. So he's hearing what Jesus has to say, but his hand is going back to what's familiar, and he's trying to decide, do I want what Jesus is saying, or do I want to go with what works? And by the way, that's how we all read the Sermon on the Mount. All of us have our hand on something that we want to hold on to, because we hear what Jesus is saying, and it sounds good, but Lord knows it's not practical. And we'll do it if somebody else goes first. Right? But on the other side, in the foreground, what do we have? Got a mother. She has an infant with her, or a toddler. And what's he doing? Who's he pointing at? Jesus. So the child is pointing to Jesus and saying, yeah, listen to this guy. This is good stuff. The world would be a whole lot better if it worked this way, friends. And, and this, is, this is an allusion, I think, to a statement that Jesus makes in the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel where he declares, unless you come to me as a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, we have to come in trust. We have to hear what it is Jesus has to say, and then we have to decide that we're going to trust him. And so the Beatitudes, do you see, are Jesus very counterintuitive way of letting us know that we are most ready to enter into the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God that he's proclaiming when we have reached these unpleasant places in life, but they really are a blessing because they make us ready to hear what he has to say. And that brings us to the beatitude that we're going to be looking at today, and it's the sixth uh, verse of the fifth chapter. Uh, this is the beatitude we'll be looking at this morning. Let's read this together. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So what is Jesus driving at in this particular uh, beatitude, or they're also called macarisms? Well, he's laying out the idea again that we should consider ourselves blessed, meaning happy, content, fulfilled, when we're experiencing something. And it's not a good thing, or at least not, it's, it's not something we normally enjoy or prize, and that is when we are hungry and when we are thirsty. Does anyone here enjoy that? Really not. And, and yet we, we know what it means to be hungry and thirsty, don't we? You know, our bodies are marvelous, uh, but they need fuel to run. And when 
it gets to the point where that fuel is running low. The brain uh, activates uh, impulses of hunger. So we know to go out and eat something, to get some food. That's how it's supposed to work. And then there is thirst. We know what it means to be thirsty, right? You know, the body needs hydration in order to operate as it should. And when we are running low on, on water, our brain sends a signal that we're thirsty and we drink a soda. <laughs> Just kidding. Drink water, right? And, and there are two types of hunger and thirst. There's the kind we can do something about and there's the kind we really can't do much about, at least uh, in the immediate future. Uh, for instance, right now, you may have suddenly become aware that you're hungry. Now, for those of you that are worshiping online, you can do something about that. <laughs> you can put me on pause, and you go get some toast. But for those of us here in the sanctuary, out of luck. Although we will have coffee and cookies after the service. So there's hunger and thirst we can do something about, hunger and thirst we can't really do something about, and we're frustrated by that. And that's the kind of hunger and thirst that Jesus is talking about in this beatitude. It's when we are hungry and when we are thirsty on an ongoing basis. And not for food, but for righteousness. What does that mean? Well, righteousness here has the sense of uh, rightness. Righteousness here is when you and I take a look at the world around us and we see how it operates and we are deeply disappointed that it isn't better than it is. Is that ringing any bells? It's when we look at ourselves and we evaluate our own behavior and how we're operating in the world and we just, we're disappointed. We're not, we get a sense, a conviction that we're not working as we should. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness is that place that you and I come to when we look at ourselves and the world around us and we say, that ain't right. Something better has to be possible. And you see, it's when we come to that point that Jesus invites us to himself. And he says, yeah, the world doesn't work the way it should. And you don't work the way you should. But come to me and I'm going to fill, I'm going to satiate, I'm going to meet that hunger and that thirst. Uh, Jesus was pretty clear about this in the Gospels. In John chapter 6, for instance, he declares, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And you see, this is why the best way, I think, to approach the Sermon on the Mount is not as a it's not like Jesus has given us a new legal code and saying, okay, if you can live up to this standard, then maybe God will find you acceptable. Can't work that way. Martin Luther was right. The Sermon on the Mount is an incredibly high standard and vision for who we can be and what the world can be. No, it's, it's not that Jesus is giving us a new code that we have to live up to. He's giving us a new vision that can inspire us to live into a new reality because it's possible now through him. And one day it'll come in glory. You know, Jesus promised his disciples when he ascended that one day he would return and the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven would be completed here on earth. But for now, it's here and there and it activates when we enter into it and then start to live that way. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is. Jesus trying to show us what it looks like. So we might be like that, like that toddler, signifying and saying, that's what I want. And, and this is, again, we see this all through the Sermon on the Mount. At one point in it, for instance, Jesus addresses this natural human tendency that we have to judge other people. I mean, it's blood sport. We just love to do it. We love to develop standards, often that we don't want to live up to ourselves, and we just put them on other people willy-nilly. And we love to evaluate other people and what they do and judge them and criticize them. It's, it's kind of just, it's kind of entertainment at some point, right? And, and Jesus, Jesus said, well, yeah, that's the way the world works. But bottom line, when we're busy judging other people, that's just a screen so that we don't have to look where? Ourselves. The minute you and I give into that trap of spending all our energy judging other people and criticizing them, that's a trap that we fall into 
It's a screen that keeps us from looking where we should be looking, where the kingdom of God invites us to look, and that's at ourselves. So here's how Jesus described that. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, well, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Or or wealth and possessions was something that Jesus addressed when it came to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Because he knew that we, we so naturally fall into the trap that the world sets for us of trying to secure our future, our sense of, of safety and security for the future in the wealth and the possessions that we can own and control and possess. And yet that doesn't work. Why? Well, because we know those things are not permanent. So they can't give us that sense of stability that we're hungry for. There's nothing wrong with pursuing those things. But in the kingdom of God, we have a vision of using them for the benefit and the needs of ourselves and our families, yes, but also looking to deploy them in a way that's going to heal the world because that's what pleases God. Here's how Jesus describes that. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Or finally, we live in a world where uh, there's a lot of anger and enmity and hatred and warfare. And the basic principle we're confronted with all the time, the way the world works, is if someone hits you, what do you do? Hit them back. Hit them harder. Hit them harder. Does that work? Not a trick question. No, but we still go there, don't we? And we think hating our enemies is, is just, we're justified, right? We're bombarded with this kind of reasoning all the time. But that's not the kingdom of God. It's not the kingdom of heaven. Jesus described that this way. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Now, those are just three examples. I could go on, but I'm not sitting down. (laughs) If I was sitting down, we'd go on for about another half hour. But that's what the Sermon on the Mount is trying to do, do you see? When we get to the point of realizing we're blessed because we're hungry and thirsty for righteousness or rightness for something better in the world and for us, Jesus is showing up and saying, come to me, I got you. And then as we hear him teach about this new way that we can be and the world can be shaped, we have to decide, going back to that woodcut, who who we're going to be. We're going to be like that guy sitting down hearing what Jesus has to say, pondering it, but still keeping our hand on the way the world works because that's familiar to us. We're going to be like that child pointing at Jesus and saying, that's, that's what I need. That's what the world needs. And maybe this week, just with the three illustrations that we looked at from the Sermon on the Mount, we can, we can try some things out. What it might mean for us to enter a little more fully into the kingdom of God or the reign of God that Jesus is is inviting us to enter. Maybe you and I can think about somebody or some group of people that we've been busy judging and really enjoying. Or maybe not enjoying, it doesn't matter, but maybe think for a moment about someone, some group, could be close, could be far away, that that you've just been judging. Is, Is there a better way to instead of going there, spend some time focusing on what change God might be ready to bring into your life. Or maybe wealth and possessions. Has it gotten to the point where where wealth and possessions are controlling us rather than we controlling and using them? Is there an opportunity this week maybe to think about how we can deploy some of those resources in a way that builds up treasure that can never be taken from us? 
Or what about love? Is there an enemy afoot in your life? Is there someone that has hurt you? Is there some way to respond? I may not be able to engage them directly. That's not always possible. But to give up that hatred that the world so encourages and think instead, okay, how can I maintain myself in God's economy as a person of love, even in this kind of situation? I don't know what it might be for you, but the invitation is open. And Jesus always comes to us and invites us into the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven so that with his help we can literally become the change that we want to see in the world. And that's a very good thing indeed. Amen. We invite you to get to know our community better. You can do that by exploring our YouTube channel and do hit subscribe and check notifications so we can send you any future updates. You can also explore our community of faith at the church website, lopc.org. And we hope you know there's always a place for you here.